Hello, hello there. This is John Harris, and uh, this, welcome to the uh, V Brown Bag U.S. edition once again. Uh, tonight, we're going to continue covering our V Brown Bag DevOps series. Uh, tonight, we actually uh, have Evo uh, Van Dorn on, and tonight he's going to be covering uh, config management with Chef. Um, so I'm just going to cover a couple quick notes, and then we're going to let Evo kind of introduce himself and, and run with it from there. Um, so just a couple quick notes. Um, v Brown Bag Tech Talks at the OpenStack Summit in Paris. That's going to be happening soon. If you want more information on it, there's a URL that you can kind of go check there out for the OpenStack Summit. Um, I still got a note here about the V Brown Bag Tech Talks uh, at VMworld Europe. That's actually already happened. Um, we had a lot of really great content out there, and you know those are already posted on the website. So you can go to professionalvmware.com. You can access that content, check it out, see what's up. Um, you know. You know, get, in, get involved with the conversation. You can follow at vbrownbag, um, you know, during this session. And also, you know, if you get there on Twitter, you can go ahead and uh, comment and ask questions via the vbrownbag hashtag there. Another good thing to keep in mind is, uh, you know, via the vbrownbags, we've gone global, man. We're, we're all over the country, all over the globe. Um, so, you know, we've got all these different series going. Um, or different segments, uh, different parts of the globe, um, a lot of different series is going. Um, you know, if there's something that's going on in a different part of the world and maybe you can't catch it, always remember it's up there. They're all up there on the website. Just kind of hop on, um, you know, ask questions or um, pull down the content, listen to it. Um, you can also ask questions, things of that sort. And today, like I said, you know, our host tonight is Evo Van Dorn. I'm John Harris. I'm your host. And at this point, you know, Evo, go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us, uh, you know, a little about yourself. And while you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and change you to presenter. Sounds good, John. <clears throat> All right, so my name is uh, Evo Van Dorn. I'm with Chef. I run the uh, Solutions Architect team at Chef. I've been with uh, Chef for about a year and a half. Um, come from an interesting background. I've been both uh, in sales engineers, uh, system administrator. So at this point, I've... Uh, I've had about 10 years of system administrator experience, and then uh, now I'm hopefully preaching config management, but more importantly, uh, infrastructure as code uh, to a wider audience. So hopefully my screen shows up. Yeah, um, actually, I can see it there. It's, it's showing up great. Perfect. So um, before we dive into you know, the whole demo of Chef, which I think I have, I have a few use cases set up and a few uh, demos set up that we can cover, and we'll see what the product can do and, and how it works when uh, you make certain changes to your environment. Um, we're going to cover a little bit of you know Death Pack PowerPoint. Not really; it's it's 18 slides, but um, really it's a one to sort of lay, set an overview of Chef. So it talks a bit of some of the the acronyms and the the, the verbiage we use within the Chef community. And then um, we'll also talk a little bit about our integration points with VMware that we have today. So hopefully GoToMeeting is friendly and, and shows uh, the entire screen. So It's looking good. Perfect. Um, so uh, first let's start with an overview of Chef. So Chef is, uh, as John mentioned, it's a, it's a configuration management. Uh, it, it has the ability to do configuration management, but on top of that, it's really a framework to do infrastructure as code. So infrastructure as code is like this you know, term that was coined a few years ago. But it, the idea is, is that you can define your entire application or sets of applications all as code and you can re repeat that in various environments, whether it be uh, different cloud environments like VCA or VMware or Amazon, but also different physical environments like uh, or logical environments like QA and development and production. Um, so Chef, what we call reusable definitions to an automate desired state, what, really what we mean by that is, is that you can define policy through what we call cookbooks and recipes and then expect that what you've declared in those cookbooks and recipes is what you'll actually get on the machine. Um, Chef, it does work on a variety of platforms. At this point, we support various Linux variants like Red Hat and uh, Ubuntu uh, and, and you know Debian. And then you have your various Unix variants, so AIX is uh, something we recently introduced, Solaris, um, and, and really last of all is Windows. Like Windows is a really big player in the market. It needs configuration management and infrastructure as code just as uh, much as the Unix and Linux vari variants do, so we uh, have support for that as well. Um, so let's talk about like the 
uh, concepts within Chef. So starting from the from the uh, block down up, uh, there's really let's start with resources, recipes, and cookbooks. So um, resources is really something you would is an action of, of some sort. So a, a resource could be a package you have to install, a service you have to enable, a directory that needs to be present. Um, Chef comes with 150 built-in resources that are very well documented on Chef's website. You would actually say what you want to do with that w resource, whether you want to have something installed or removed or a user that needs to be present or make sure it's gone. These are all things you would do through uh, recipes, and we'll just cover that in a moment. Um, the cool thing about resources is um, once you get into a place where you're familiar with 150 or so resources that Chef comes built in, uh, you can actually add your own resources. So uh, once you uh, you can actually create custom resources that may tie into your specific software applications or hardware uh, APIs. Like these are all things you can actually extend Chef into. So once you have a bunch of resources, um, you now actually put them all in a recipe. Now a recipe is just like in cooking. Um, there's a set of directions that you have to execute on a machine, and the, and just like cooking. You can't really, you know, mix the eggs before you add the flour or something like that. So, re right resources are actually executed in the order that they're listed, and this is actually really important to Chef. Like, you wouldn't actually try to configure a template of a for Apache before Apache is actually installed on the machine. The same goes for you wouldn't try to start Apache before Apache was on the machine. So, the, so Chef takes some of that like system administrator. Uh, scripting knowledge that we've been using for decades and applies it into the configuration man management portion. And uh, there's an example of how, for example, to install a web server on both Linux-based operating systems and Windows-based operating systems. So there's a nice little like screenshot of that. Now, once you have a bunch of reset, uh, ha, nice. Once you have a bunch of uh, recipes you actually would put them all together into a cookbook. So um, you may have a recipe that enables a service. You may have a recipe that disables a service. You may have recipes that enable certain modules within that service. Uh, for example, Apache can be, you know, the, the default recipe might say, hey, install Apache. But you may have another recipe that says, but now enable the mod SSL module. So these are all actually really different recipes, but they belong part of the same cookbook. So once you're familiar with resources, recipes, and cookbooks, you start getting a little bit more into the, OK, so I want to combine them or modify them at will. And this is where roles and environments come into play. So roles is where you would specify a list of recipes that you want to run on that machine. Rather than you having to spell out a bunch of recipes that have to run on each and every machine inside the run list, um, which would be really tedious and boring, um, you can actually do this all without within a role. Now, the, the, just like recipes, the order that you've decided to run your recipes in is critical here. So the recipe, the recipe you specify first will run first, and the same goes for the one you run second, uh, and so on and so on. So uh, as you're trying to set up an application on a machine, for example, maybe a database, you may have a recipe that insults the database, but you might have a separate recipe that initializes the schema. And so you need ordering of your recipes in order to make that happen. And this is what a, a role or a cookbook can do. And then right next to it, you have what we call an environment. So an environment is, can be used for versioning of the cookbook. So by default, all the cookbooks are versioned. In an environment, you can actually constrain those versions. Like you have a development environment where you're not constraining your your uh, cookbook versions, but you may have a production environment where you're saying only the versions of these cookbooks are allowed to run uh, in, inside the production environment. That's any node that is part of production. And in the demo, I'll show you kind of what that looks like. So once you um, grok the, you know, the roles and environments part of Chef, you have the last thing that's really data bags. Now, data bags is, is a really a variable or set of data that can be accessed through Chef uh, through either search or recipes. Now, a, a data bag can be something like a software version or a key. or in, and, and by the way, a data bag can be both encrypted and not encrypted. And encrypted data bags, they require a separate key, and you'll have to handle that. But uh, there, are, there is a way to actually make sure that the data coming from a data bag is encrypted. Um, but the idea is, is that um, this is going to be completely accessible to Chef, and the Chef server will index that data bag. 
Uh, a great example of a data bag would be a user object. So you may have a user called Bob, and inside that data bag you'll have their shell, their UID, their home directory, and these are all things that you can access globally using key value search uh, terms. And then the last, like not really building block, but really the thing that the glue that holds it all together is the attributes. So attributes are either um, defined by the state of the node itself. So we have a program called OHI that runs on the machine, comes with a ton of attributes, like anything from like system memory available to consume, your system uptime, your FQDN, how many processors are available, all these things are actually like collected every single time Chef runs. So we call that the state of the node itself. Um, attributes can also be furthermore defined by cookbooks. So inside of either what we call an attribute file or a recipe file, you can set, hey, I want the system path for my log directory to be this, and you would store that as an attribute. Uh, furthermore, attributes can also be stored inside roles and environments, and there's actually a interesting precedence ordering. This is where roles and environments get like a lot of fun, because you could have a default attribute set in your cookbooks, but depending on the role or environment, you could have it overruled uh, by specifying that attribute again inside of a role or environment. Um, so attributes are saved every single time Chef runs, so, and, and notably every single time Chef successfully runs. So we're not going to store back bad attribute data. So if, for example, Chef didn't complete successfully, we're not going to store that data back on the Chef server. That, that would be no good. Um, but every single time Chef runs successfully, we're going to store that attribute data back and can be immediately searched on by other resources or other recipes. Any questions? Nope. Well, you know, I'm going to, maybe I'll let you proceed here because it looks like you're already segueing into, you know, Chef and VMware. But just, yep. just so you know, a question did come out already where they're kind of asking, you know, how would you use Chef and VCO to kind of integrate uh, you know, for maybe provisioning a new server or stuff, are there ways to use those tools together? Yeah, so it, we'll definitely cover that. Not specifically VCO, but I think it will become very clear where the integration points of what VCO can do and where Chef would take over. Um, so I'd say VCO is the one that would set up the machine and then you would hand it over to Chef to actually let the management or final configuration machine take place by Chef. And then at that point, be under control by Chef. Um, but I think this part will make sense. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yep. So, so Chef and VMware together. So, right now there's like two big ways uh, that we're integrating with VMware uh, through either vSphere or vCloud Air. So, at at uh, and we'll cover just a moment what Knife is. But at VMworld, we announced the a vCR plugin and integration to vCR. Uh, one of our uh, one of my colleagues, Matt Ray, stood up on stage and and demoed. Uh, Knife VCR in front of a, a big wide audience, um, and Knife vSphere is really the more popular one we see of the two, just because vSphere and vCenter is more prevalent in most VMware installations. Um, so what is Knife? So before, let's take one step back, and Knife is a program that uh, is installed when you install Chef uh, on your workstation. So either Chef DK or Chef Client comes with a tool called Knife. And really what that program is used for is to interact with the Chef APIs. As mentioned way early on, Chef is completely API driven. And the way you interact with Chef is through communicating with that API. And Knife is, is an example of how to communicate with Chef. The cool thing about Chef though, and about Knife specifically, is you can extend Knife to talk to other APIs. So Knife doesn't just have to talk to Chef, but Knife can also talk to vSphere or to VCR or any VMware pr uh, product that has an API available. So, and outside of VMware, it can also talk to various other things in the world. Um, but that's exactly what Knife can do. So, we have a few integration points using Knife. So today we have uh, three plugins that you can download on either community.getchef.com or off of GitHub. Um, but Knife VCR, Knife vSphere, Knife ESX all have different integration points into VMware. And then coming soon is the Knife VCAC plugin that we're developing right now with VMware. So starting at the very top is the Knife VC, clear, VC Air. So you can currently um, provision new VMs. You can also delete and list current VMs. Um, and you can also make sure that when you deploy a VM, it's part of the right network. Um, and again, that's available on GitHub. Um, Knife ESX 
is used to just uh, to provision or to administer a single hypervisor. So if you have multiple hypervisors, but they're not tied together by vCenter or, v, or vCenter, or vCenter, um, you would use Knife ESX. Um, this is typically used in smaller environments that just uh, they're evaluating um, VMware. Uh, these days, a lot of people though have Knife vSphere. So and and with that is Knife vSphere is probably the most popular way to integrate VMware and Chef together. So Knife vSphere can both talk to vSphere but talk to Chef at the same time. So it can clone a template that you may have hosted in vSphere and then the moment the cloning is done, um, Chef would take over and actually configure the machine with various roles and environments and recipes that you specified at the time of running the command. So the, to talk about the VCO integration that would probably happen at the knife vSphere level. So you would instead of um, vSphere, you probably have VCO, and then you would have Chef take over and probably use the knife bootstrap functionality as opposed to sh the straight up knife vSphere fun functionality, and it could then uh, finish the uh, the installation or configuration of that node. Hey, so j just a note. I mean, uh, so just something that I've seen at least. You know, I'm on the VMware side. You know, and I work heavily with things like VCAC and stuff. And things that I am seeing is people are maybe using VCO to go out and maybe install the chef agent and yes. get it configured so that as soon as that machine is provisioned, VCO goes and puts that agent on there and then chef takes over from there and does the config management. So I'm, I'm seeing a lot of that today. Just yeah, no, that's, yeah, it's totally awesome. Uh, we, I see that as well. Actually, in fact, I recommend a few customers of mine to do that. Um, the way you would do that is uh, the, the, the really the few important files to make sure are present are the, uh, the client.rb file, which would tell to go to which chef server needs to talk to, the validator key from that chef server. So the validator key is a special key, and the only right it has is to add client, uh, clients to the chef server. It has no other right. So the moment that the client is added to the chef server, it gets its own private key, and the validator key no longer needs to be there. And then the last thing, if you're using VCO to kick off, uh, a chef run and a chef's already installed is the first dash boot dot json file and really what that does is it specifies the recipes or roles it needs to run okay hey, cool so I got another question I'm sorry I'm just full of questions here you know on that on that sense that that json file that first boot json file I think you were saying I mean is that something that's kind of like just like if somebody's new to JSON, is that something that they're just going to have that they can put in there, or is that something that they need to create? How would you suggest somebody even get started with that? Yeah, you'd create it, but it's three lines of code. Um, I think it's open curly bracket, your recipe list or your role list, and close curly bracket. Oh, okay. Well, so, easy peasy. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing too exciting. <laughs> Um, so um, let's let's go on to the demo. So Chef has like different ways of showing the product, and the the very first thing is I'm going to utilize the uh, the VMware Fusion install that I have locally. Um, and currently, I have a, a Windows Server 2012 R2 machine up and running that I spun up today, and is running a uh, what we call the fourth coffee store store. So if I were to hit this in my web browser, and it's only available locally, so no no public internet access on this one. Um, you can Bummer. see that I'm currently, yeah, I know. I'm not going to DDoS my, myself. Um, <laughs> so as you can see right now, we have the fourth coffee store. Now I'm from Seattle, so coffee is sort of an important thing to us. Uh, Chef is also uh, located in Seattle, so we're going to go with the coffee theme. Um, you can currently buy some, you know, Chef cookies online. Um, but, you know, the fourth coffee people have been really thinking about hard of, like, we're working to expand our business. And, and someone in development has actually been working on a catering service. So I ended up ready to roll that out to production. So once I log into the Chef environment, and, and I cheated, I already logged in. But uh, the cool thing about Chef is is that we have a, an awesome hosted solution. So you can go to manage.offscode.com or manage.kidschef.com and uh, create an organization. You don't actually have to give any credit card information. You just, it's like seven lines and you're done and you can start playing with Chef so you don't have to worry about setting up the server. Um, so I'm using that hosted solution and I logged into it and I can look at my Windows 2012 object and you know there's a bunch of things. You can see that it's around the fourth coffee recipe where there's a role that only has fourth coffee running. It's also part of the production environment. 
So in, in this case, what we're doing with the uh, production environment, and if I click on environments and production, you can see that I'm actually um, telling the production environment only release 0 0.11 of my uh, fourth coffee cookbook. But you know, the developers have been working hard, and they say it's stable, and they ran through all the tests, and everything looks great. Um, so you know, I trust them. So I'm going to update the, the version to 0 0.20, which is the version that they told me is what's running now. So I'm going to save that new constraint, and there it is. So saved immediately, and I'm going to go back over to my uh, VMware environment and just run Chef Client. Now, Chef is running as a service on here, but I'm going to spare everybody the sanity of not waiting till it runs next, which is every 30 minutes, and I think that's like another nine minutes away. So I'm just going to run an ad hoc. And hey, so to... well, that's running. I got a question. Is there a way to test that version rather than just running it and hoping that, you know, the developers did do their piece? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. Yeah, there is a dry run mode within Chef. Um, there is many opinions on dry run, uh, which I'll say I'm not going to – I'm going to spare everybody from the opinions. But uh, dry run is something that has that is available within Chef that you can use to execute – uh, like these are all the changes I'm going to make, but I'm not going to make on the machine. Um, we see this uh, used very often when someone is getting familiar with Chef, that as they go through sort of the Chef learning curve, and, and, and really there's not a lot of learning curve anymore. There used to be, but I think we've really addressed that through the various learning campaigns that we do. But as someone gets more comfortable with Chef, um, they get familiar with the, the concept of uh, test-driven development, and they start testing their changes much earlier on in the process so that the need for dry run really gets mitigated by here are the, my test results and I can assure you that they're correct. Um, I would still, as a sysadmin and not a developer, I would still do AB release. Like I wouldn't just go all in. I would still go, okay, like I, I appreciate your test cases, but let's still, you know, do like some sort of gating on that release before we go all in. Um, but um, so yes, dry run, but eventually I'd hope you'd use things like Test Kitchen and Food Critic and Chef Spec to actually verify that the changes you've made are, are good changes. Does that answer it? Or? Yeah, absolutely. And just to follow up on that, obviously you're running it on one box here. I assume there's an easy way to deploy it to multiple boxes at once, right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, th there are different methods. You can either um, run and execute this from Knife, so Knife has the ability to talk to more. Um, we also have a fairly new feature functionality called Chef Metal, and Chef Metal has this new uh, resource, so earlier we talked about resources, um, but it's now called the machine resource, so you actually define entire machines inside of a recipe, and the idea is that you can actually um, describe your entire application stack inside of a recipe, and all those machine resources would have the recipe it needs to run and execute against that. And at this point, um, they, there's a very, very wide driver ecosystem available. Thanks to companies like CenturyLink Cloud, um, they actually have uh, developed an amazing uh, vSphere driver that interacts with your vSphere uh, in order to make that happen. Awesome. And, and just one other note, is there, is there a way that you could magnify your text or your screen yeah. there? So just so we get a little better view on the, the end here. Yeah, that's fair. Um, let's see here. This is where VMware does some, some fusion, does some crazy things with your display. Let's see here. Or not. Let's see here. Well, that gets really big quick. <laughs> All right, so... I have the zoom function. I don't know how big this is, but basically what it's doing, it's doing a deploy of an application here, and it's removing old files as well. Gotcha. Yeah. Let's see here. Let's see if we can make that a little bit friendlier. under settings these days, yeah. Aha. Bam. Do not respect the retina display. 
Which, by the way, John, when you switch, oh, see, now I've done it. Um, <laughs> when you uh, when you get a Mac, make sure uh, you are aware of this. There you go. Sorry, I didn't mean to take you off track there. Just that way, folks can no. see the text as you're kind of going through the commands there. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, thankfully, the Windows part isn't very long after this, but let's see if we can run rerun Chef Client. Like the cool thing about Chef Client is. Uh, if I were to run it again, it's not going to make any changes. So let's see if we can see if we can make it bigger. Yeah, is this a little bit bigger than it was? I think it it looks bigger on my side. Yeah, it's a little bit bigger. Let's go ahead and uh, let's we'll just go ahead and proceed. Okay. Chef is now talking to the server, and damn, okay, I'll just leave it be. So what it does here is it, it gets a run list from the Chef server. It tells it, oh, you're using fourth coffee. It grabs all the dependencies from that, and as it's executing, you can see like a green bar come up. It's verifying that it doesn't actually make any changes, and you can see a bunch of up-to-dates on the left side. Um, I realize it might be small for some of you. Um, and if I were to now click on this website, it takes a second because IS is, there we go, um, catering is now a new product um, for a, you know, great deal of $7 or $6.99 so you can get uh, cookies catered to you. Again, you can't get it on this website. I don't want you ordering cookies from me. Um, but this is one way of how you would do it on the Windows side. And this is, um, if we open that recipe, so um, I usually get that as a following question. We'll look at, and we can make this one bigger. So, so if we look at what a recipe would look like. Is first where there's an attribute that says, which way are we going to install? Now, recently we've uh, incorporated or announced uh, PowerShell DC support. So this is we're actually using the DC method to install the site. So what we're doing here is through uh, PowerShell's own DC provider on the machine. So we're making sure we're running uh, Windows Management Framework 4.0 or above. And since this is 2012 R2, it already comes with it. Uh, we're making sure that the web server and .NET 4, 4 5 uh, resources are installed. Um, and these are actually handed off to the Windows DC framework as opposed to handled by Chef. We're just a facilitator. And once that's actually up and running, we have a recipe that says remove the default IIS website. So when you install IIS on Windows for the you know, Windows fans out there, it comes with this default website just like Apache comes with its default website on the Unix side. Uh, we're going to disable that and get rid of it. Um, we're going to make sure that the remote directory where we have to install our website is present. And this is actually how we configure our IS site later on. Um, IS has this concept of site pools. So before you can install a site, you have to enable a pool. Um, this is very similar to like on the VMware side where you have to have a cluster or data center before you actually install a pool. Um, so IS again. As a, we have facilities through what we call the IS cookbook that says, all right, so when we, we are defining IS pool, what it should be called, what version of the runtime should we run for that pool. Uh, and then the last but not least, again, chef recipes run in order. Um, we actually enable the site. We tell it to run on port 80. We say, hey, we put all our files down on the install path right here. And then make sure you add it and make sure you start the site as well. And so, ta-da, we got, you know, catering for our fourth coffee website. All right. So, that's on the Windows side. So, um, on the Linux side, I'm going to make sure this is bigger, too. Looking good. Awesome. So, on the Linux side, um, one of the biggest use cases that I often encounter in a POC is managing the root password. Now, uh, this is one way I wouldn't manage it, but in a, it, gets, it does a really great way of showing you what Chef can do. So if I go into my managed, I have a managed root uh, cookbook. So 
I open this up and we take a look at my recipe, all I'm doing here is I'm defining the user root, saying, hey, so we're going to change the comment to saying it's a chef managed uh, root user. So that way, someone that gets into the Etsy password file knows, oh, oh, that thing's maintained by chef. It's not maintained by me. Um, you're going to make sure that the UID and GID is set to zero. And make sure the home directory is slash root. On Linux, it tends to be slash root. Um, my shell's been bash. And then the password part is an attribute, as you can see. Now, the default attribute, which is stored right here, um, has a hash, a uh, SHA-512 checksum set to the password uh, VMware. Now, you can't really read that out of that, but that actually says VMware. Um, and so when this recipe would run on a machine that's not part of an environment, um, you would actually, uh, what it would do is it would change the, v the password to VMware. So um, if I were to log into one of our uh, hosts, so we have, I have two hosts, uh, that's uh, in our vSphere lab. So, and I appropriately named the v, uh, v brown bag. So Apple one. There you go, awesome. So I just logged in, and we can take a look at the cat. Uh, we can uh, we can cap the Etsy password file. You can see that it's currently managed by root, um, and we can look at the shadow. And you can see that right there, it's set to that. So let's log back into the Chef Management side, and since we're logged into VBB Apple One. Um, currently, there is no run list. This is me trying out earlier. So what we'll do is we'll add uh, the managed root recipe into the run list. We'll hit save. Um, but we'll also change the environment. So currently, it's set to the default environment. If I were to do that, it's not going to show anything. So let's make it part of the development environment. So now you have the managed root cookbook, and it's part of the development environment. Now, why is that so special? So if I were to click on the policy, and environments, and then development, there's a special attribute set under default where it shows that the password is going to be a little bit different. So we're going to now run Chef Client on here, because again, in the, in the interest of not waiting, <laughs> we'll see that the root user was updated, so hence why it says 1 out of 1. If I were to run it again, it should say 0 out of 1. And I'll scroll back up after it's done, I promise. You'll see 0 out of 1 since we didn't make any changes. But um, since we did make a change here, it'll say, hey, we, we're looking at the managed root cookbook. The, the cookbook didn't have any dependencies defined, so it was just a single uh, cookbook run. It's saying, hey, we're going to create the root user. It might say action create, but really what it did is it altered. Um, because the user already existed, but certain parameters, like the password in this case, have to be altered. And if I look at the shadow, well, that shadow matches the shadow that's stored. In this one, now I know this text on the left is much smaller than the right, but if you look at the last three, it ends in AZW period, and we got it here, AZW period as well. If I log back out and log back in, if I type in VMware, it should fail hard. And if I type in development, because I named that development, it will lock me back in. But as we were doing that, the reporting on the Chef website also collected the run history off that machine. And here you can see that the password for root was changed. And they'll actually tell you, like, this is the, the things that we changed on that user. And then when it ran again, it's reported that no changes were made. Hey, so Eva? Got another question that came through. Yeah. Um, somebody was asking, so basically what they're asking is, can a, can a cookbook have recipes that are like cross-platform for Windows and Linux? And they're saying, like, say in your example, you know, it, so it could actually push the website to, say, you know, IIS on a Windows box and Apache on Linux. Absolutely. Um, so, yes, well, let me, yes, yes. Um, but from best practices, <laughs> what I would do is I would actually create a um, what we call, so the thing what you can do with cookbooks is cookbooks can inherit one another. And so in your case, what I would do, the person asking the question, is I would actually create a web server cookbook or something or an application cookbook 
that defines that application. And then inside the application cookbook, we have uh, our DSL, our language really, provides a way to specify specific platforms. So you would have a platform family for Red Hat and a platform family for Windows. And it would then um, actually call out the right cookbooks to make a web server on Windows or a web server on, on Red Hat. This way, um, the idea about cookbooks is that you describe like an application, like an application you're trying to deploy or an application you're trying to manage. Um, but you would have now the application you're trying to deploy call out to applications you're trying to manage that use that application. It's, it, we call those wrapper cookbooks or, or application cookbooks. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. And so a, as you can see, we uh, successfully ran Chef. Um, the, the dashboard on, on hosted Chef will also tell you also sometimes the, the time it took to run Chef. So the thing that once it took five, like more than five minutes, or under five, un, above five minutes but under ten minutes, this is when um, the Windows uh, VM was blank and brand new. And so it had to be conf completely configured from the ground up. And that one took the longest, but subsequent runs took a lot quicker. And that's why you're seeing that most of our runs are under, at this point, under 10 seconds. Um, so, so that's how you would manage the root user. But let's take a look a little, little further. So we have, um, in the policy, we have various roles. And so I have a fourth coffee role that we can't apply to a Linux box. It's just um, you can't install IS on a, win on a Linux box. I mean, you can, but it's not pretty. Um, and it has better ways of doing that. So we're focused on the base and the web server role. Um, and we'll start with the base role. So the base role has a bunch of cookbooks that are already installed in the machine, or has a bunch of cookbooks added together. So first of all, it's, uh, there's an MOTD cookbook. And really what the MOTD cookbook does is it sets the message of the day. Um, IP tables disabled cookbook. Now, I apparently I don't believe in security. I don't recommend the same to everybody. But in this case, I'm just going disable my IP tables. I, I got other things to take care of. Um, don't do that. It's bad. Um, and then uh, Chef Client is the last cookbook. And really, this is uh, one of the cookbooks that Chef maintains. Uh, we have a really big like, community of cookbooks that you can get off of uh, community.getchef.com, uh, including uh, ones that we support as a company. Uh, but the Chef Client cookbook is really near and dear to our heart because it configures Chef, and that's sort of important to us. Um, so the Chef Client Cookbook, in this case, uh, there's uh, the default way of managing Chef Client on non-Windows is daemonizing the client. So that's exactly what it does here. So we'll apply this to one of my nodes. And we'll pick on Apple One again because I'm logged into it. And we'll get base. Now, because I want base to run first, and as I mentioned earlier, the run list does actually matter. Uh, the ordering matters. I'm going to make sure that manage root runs second. And I'll hit save. And now you can see that base will run first, and it'll be in the right. If I expand base, it will actually say the position of each cookbook uh, that will run. And then manage root will run now technically fourth, because we count from zero. And I'll run Chef Client again. And as you can see now, and as it's doing that, you can see resolving cookbooks. And it actually does MOTD IP tables. And pretty much all the cookbooks, it does them in order that I described. So it kind of unfolded that, uh, that cookbook and says, OK, so you've described these four cookbooks to be run. I need all these cookbooks, including Windows, because one of these cookbooks are, is making a reference to Windows. It won't run. But there's something related in that cookbook that says, oh, I need all these cookbooks in order to make this happen. And so it'll actually make all these changes on the machine. And so what it's doing right here is it, it's putting down an MTD file. It's disabling IP tables. And now it's actually uh, making sure Chef is managed by Chef. So it's laying down an init file and all the contents and making sure that the file permissions are set correctly and that we've defined in the cookbook. And then last but not least, but make sure that the Chef Client service is also running. Now, one of the biggest differences that Chef has over some of the other solutions is that um, Chef runs and compiles on the endpoint as opposed to centrally. What this really allows us to do is scale to immense amount of like, like nodes. Um, 
because now the, the central server can be, uh, we can task it to index a search index and to maintain that and then the endpoints um, can actually run its own compile list as opposed to a central server. Um, the central server is just responsible for giving out that policy and making sure that that policy is run. So after the uh, chef is finished running, it sends back over a list of what we call the attributes that we talked about earlier. It will actually send that back to the server saying, okay, so this is you know, my state. And then on the server, you can actually see the state of the machine. And you can see here that it made 12 changes to the 15 and that it took about 25 seconds to run. If I were to run it a second time, it should run a lot quicker um, because we're not laying down all the files this time. But now it's also great for you to see what happens when it runs a second time. And so because some of these resources depend on other resources, which inflates the number, in this case by one, because that resource wasn't impacted this time, it, uh, the total resource count went down, and also the run was much quicker at five and a half seconds. And if I were to log in, um, you can see here that we show here 12 out of 15 were updated and um, 0 out of 14 were updated here. So the reporting interface is uh, pretty quick. So now we have things like the MOTD file managed. So if I were to log out and log back in, you can see that there's an MOTD file saying you have logged into vbbapple1.opscope.us. I'm like, what is this magic? How did I die? How did it know to say that in the MOTD file? So if I click on the MOTD directory, or if I open up a new tab, make it bigger, ebrown, and then in cookbooks, look at the MOTD cookbook. There's a, there's a template on the right side. So as you can see here, so you have logged into node FQD, and this is actually using one of the attributes that's stored with the chef server to say dynamically put in this information on this node. And we're not actually declaring that, and um, we call it, that's through what we call OHI. If we click on, on the actual node here, we'll click on VBB app 01. Let's see, you can actually see the FQDN be right here where it, it's, it's defined centrally, so you can actually centrally see what the state of the machine is. Um, but here's what the actual attribute is that we're taking advantage of. So what happens if someone goes, well, I'm, I'm going to change the MOTD file. Like, I don't respect what it says. So I'm brute. I'm going to go, ah, I don't care about this. Um, or script security comes in and tries to, you know, try to take over the machine. That happens. Uh, so we're on chef plan again. going to see that the contents of the file changed, and it's also going to give you one a diff of what it was to what it's going to revert it back to. And it's also going to tell you that there was a resource changed, and furthermore, it'll tell you down here that one of the 14 resources were updated. So under reports, run history, Actually, say, hey, like there was a diff. You can actually click on the button that says diff, and it'll tell you what the difference is, was between the configuration on the machine to versus this. Now, that's just the MOT file, so let's get a little crazy. Let's go to VBB Apple 2 and let's assign it the web server role. So it's currently running the managed root role, but we're going to tell it to also run the web server role. And now I've made my screen too big, and now there we go. Hit save, wait for the interface to update for a bit. I was impatient, so I forced refreshed it. Let's see, as it's doing that, we'll just log in. So the password for this machine is production, because it's part of the production environment. And as you can see, it's part of the web server role, but wait, what? Base? Like, like I didn't put base. Well, uh, with Chef, you can actually also um, combine roles together. So you have roles within roles, and just like Chef, how it says whichever is run first, within that role, the base role was mentioned first. So it actually completely shuffled 
um, my entire run list into the following order. If I were to go into policy and then roles, and click on web server, like, all this time it was very much defined that that was going on. And it also tell you the exact versions of the cookbooks it's running for each role, for each uh, uh, step of the way. So, so now that we have that defined, we're going to run Chef Client on this machine. And in addition to applying the base role, which comes in the MOTD file, it's also going to enable Apache, as you can see right here. It also determines that it needs all those cookbooks in order to make magic happen. And by magic, really, policy. So again, we're going to disable IP tables. We're going to apply an MOTD file. And we're going to enable Chef Client. These are all things that are happening right now. So now that we did all that stuff, now it's actually going to go out and make sure that Apache is installed. And as it's doing, doing that, let's see here. It's going to make sure that Apache uh, gets started. So that's happening right here. And if we run through, we'll see things like we created a configuration file called Seahawks.com because I live in Seattle and I'm a Seahawks fan. Um, then there's also, it's creating a development website called Seahawks-Devel.com, um, which is actually run on a different port. I got a problem, man. I live in Denver. I know. No, I'm no, sorry. I'm <laughs> uh, <laughs> fair enough. I realized I was like, I was, I was being very careful. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, so hey, we've not had a great season so far. So, uh, <laughs> so um, as I uh, as it's laying down various configuration files, let's take a look at our web browser, and we'll go to VBB app 02, and we'll hit port 80 first. There's no need to put port 80, but um, but we can also put VBB app 02, and go to port 81. And this is why I just saved the table, so I don't have to. You just immediately show that. So you would never do this in the real world, although surprisingly a lot of people do this, where they run the development on a different port on a production website. Um, but here's on port 80 and then port 81, uh, the two different sites. That it's configured all by one cookbook. There, I didn't mention Apache twice. I just ran Apache once. Um, so let's take a look at what that looks like. This is not the right box. That's the right box. So let's take a look at Apache. And we'll open that up in my text editor. Now, I have a, you keep seeing me type in uh, Sublime. Um, I have a little cheat in Sublime that um, I want to tell everybody right now. Like, so, um, Chef is not hard, but in case you really think Chef is hard, you can actually use Sublime to autocomplete versus various things like this, um, where you just have to fill in the blanks. And then like, I'm the lazy sysadmin. Again, no developer. Um, so this, to me, is like total heaven because I'm one very, very lazy person. Um, but that being said, which is why I picked no sublime. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. So, so in, in this recipe, what's going on is I'm installing and defining the package Apache. Again, um, best practices state I should install the Apache I'm trying to configure first. So it's, it's done first. Um, but the moment it's installed, I don't want, like, just like I did with the IIS stuff, I don't want the welcome page up. I'm like, come on, CentOS. I don't want this welcome page up. So I want to make sure that it's uh, gone. Now, this is where we get a little interesting in, in Chef. I'm only making sure it's gone if the file is there. So this block will not run the next time the file is gone. It's only going to run the one time. And this is that one dynamic block you saw earlier from 0 to 14 to 15. This is is one of the reasons what would cause the number to go up is because this resource would never get even touched because it's like, nope. Um, but having said that, it then moves into, um, so now we have sites to find. Now, in this case, we have a, an actual loop. So for each of these sites, do the following things. So site name is the first thing. This is the key value right here. So for site name and then site data. Now we'll take a look at what that looks like on the attribute side. So on the, I don't, I'm sorry, John, you're going to have to see Seahawks again. Um, so you have Seahawks. Uh -oh. Seahawks. Oh, yeah, I know. 
so these are the uh, the site names, uh, and then these this is the actual site data that comes with it. So let's go crazy and then change this one to Hong Kong's, and we'll change this one. We'll leave it on eighty one. Um, but if with this logic now it's going to create another site name called Broncos.com. It's also going to set that up. It's going to make sure that the port is set to port 81. Um, actually, we're going to change the port name as well. We'll just do 8,000. 8, um, John, what's your favorite Broncos player? Like, number. You know, to be honest with you, I was just, I don't really pay attention to football <laughs> that much. I was just razzing you, man. To... <laughs> now I'm calling you out. You're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we'll change the 88 because um, I think there's a player the 88 that's pretty good. Um, I feel like I see I have him on my fantasy league. Um, so we'll set all those things up. So we have site name Broncos. It'll set port to 88. It'll make sure that Apache gets restarted, um, and then it's going to make sure there's an index page out of our templates. So we'll take a look at what that looks like. Do so we have actually two templates? This is you know this looks like a standard Apache configuration file. And then you have your index file right here. Like this is, you know, um, this is all the HTML I remember. Um, there's not many much HTML I remember, so we're gonna go with this. Um, so this is all saved and completed. Now we made a modification, so we have to upload that cookbook first. Uh, and we're also following best practices. So what we should do is we should also bump the version up. And so currently it's in 0.3.0. .0. We'll change it to zero dot three. Ah, oh, well, you know it's a big one, so because we changed the team name, this is a big deal. So I uh, changed it to zero dot four dot zero. And back in our screen right here, like we'll do a knife cookbook. So knife is a big program. So this is you know what knife can do. As you can see, I have the vSphere stuff installed. Uh, but we'll do knife cookbook. Upload Apache. You know, seeing that new version, it's like, oh, I've got to update that. Hey, well, we're, wait, well, we're waiting yep. on that. Um, another question did come through. Pretty sure I know the answer to this, but we'll go ahead and uh, state it. Are all the cookbooks and recipes supplied in plain text version so we can read it and learn it? Yes, I can definitely make that available. Okay, awesome. Is that like yeah? So uh, cookbooks are never. If the question is, are cookbooks ever binary objects? No. Um, if is, if you're asking if you want access to these cookbooks after um, the V Brown bag is over today, absolutely. I'll upload them to my GitHub and I'll give you the URL to John. Oh well, let's say both then. <laughs> I think that okay. uh, awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Yeah, no problem. So. Um, as we did that, we'll log back into um, that, you know, that poor Apache server. So VBB, Apo2, and yep, MOTD is applied. It's definitely uh, there. So let's do Chef Client. This is part of the live demo. Let's see if it works. Oh, there we go. We got Broncos. That's it. That's a good sign. And it's, it, it did see an update, 4 out of 24. So let's change this to 88. And there we go. We got we love the Broncos, or we love Broncos. It's probably missing in V. We should probably make a, an update to that. But uh, you know, we're in IT, man. We don't need to follow grammar rules. IT, exactly. Grammar schmammer. <laughs> so um, at this point, we got um, Apache up and running. We got a web server role. Um, what are the questions uh, out there? Because, I mean, this is for me. Uh, this is kind of how what Chef can do. We can go more into the uh, enterprise side, but okay. So, uh, so when you say enterprise side, are we looking at the open source version? Is that what we're seeing today? Then, um, actually, the, the version, yeah, the version that we're seeing today is actually the hosted version, which is not the uh, open source version. Um, it's a great question. So Chef recently, uh, with Chef 12 coming out, we recently combined code bases. So previously, Enterprise Chef and Chef Open Source Chef were two different products. What we've done now is is that when someone goes to Chef or GetChef.com, um, they download the Chef server. 
um, that's the open source version. Whether you're an enterprise customer or enterprise or not, that's just the version that you get. Um, and then if you want to install the, the enterprise add-ons, uh, once you've set up the, the base Chef 12 server, you can then install, uh, run a few commands to in, enable the new uh, functionality. And that's one of them is the web UI, which is what this is, which is definitely an enterprise feature. Another feature is the reporting feature, which is what this is. Um, and as you can see, like it's fairly useful. You can see how many times reports run and like your actual run history. Um, you also have user administration and then just the central overview of what everything looks like. Um, in addition to that, you have a, a thing called analytics. So any action, this is not available in the hosted platform because this is more meant for inside your data center. Um, but the analytics is used to see all the actions that your chef server is doing. So it's keeping track of cookbooks being uploaded, and clients being changed, things coming into the environment. Um, there's a lot of exciting things we're going to be doing that, with that in the next few months. Um, and so th these are all additional features that you would add on. But by default, um, the Chef Server 12 is it's completely open source. Um, you should consume it. It's super easy to install. Um, just like the Chef Client um, is the same version, whether you're using enterprise or open source. So if you ever were to go down like, hmm, you know, this fancy UI, I might need that. Um, you don't have to like do a complete redeployment of your chef environment. Like all you would have to do is run that one command and install the web UI, and you're off to the horse, like to the races. So that's sort of uh, like how our product works. Okay, and just just to, for clarification, so you're saying like, so I'm the guy here, and I got my home lab, and I want to go and I want to spin this thing up in my home lab and play with it and bang it around. If yeah. I pull it down, do do I get the enterprise features, or um, currently, by default, no. But you can. It's there's a command that you can run. Um, we actually give the enterprise version away, and this is where I may get marketing to yell at me. Uh, I think it's up to 50 free nodes. So if you have under 50 servers, which most home labs do, um, like your own, hopefully, um, you can totally run with the enterprise version and never talk to anyone at Chef. Well, that's good. And then leading into that, how is the licensing handled for Chef? Um, the licensing is, is uh, subscription-based, so um, I don't know the exact cost. Um, that's what we have salespeople for. Um, <laughs> love them. I, I got you there. Totally, I'm, I'm in the same totally role. Right, exactly. Totally what they're supposed to do. And just like I wouldn't want them talking to people about what a cookbook does and a recipe does, I give them the same respect of what pricing looks like. Um, so uh, pricing, uh, notwithstanding, it's subscription-based. So... Uh, we try to make it as approachable as possible for every customer. Um, we've worked at, at this point with very small customers, like um, a lot of startups in Bay Area use both our hosted product and maybe some, some of them now use our on-premise product um, to the very large customers like GE Capital that uh, use our on-site product. And, and they all, we, we all approach them differently. So. So, but in the end, it's it's basically subscription-based and it's like a per-node price or is it packaged or... Um, there's there are packages available for the hosted version. I believe there's packages available for uh, the on-prem version, but it is at the end of the day it is per node. So um, once you get into the very large customers, like the mega ones, uh, then there's enterprise licenses and all the stuff that, you know, again, I have an amazing talented salespeople for that. So <laughs> no, I got gotcha. you. I know how that goes. And how that discussion goes. So at this point, I'm not really seeing any other questions, but I'm going to throw it out there. If anybody's got any questions, we still got this guy for maybe a couple more minutes. So ask him or forever hold your peace. Or it's evo at it's the proper evo at getchef.com is my email address. You know, another one to throw up there is go ahead and throw up your Twitter handle too, man. They can hit you right up on Twitter. I'm sure you love getting the questions there. Yep. <laughs> so we're going to give it a moment here and uh, see if we get any other questions. And, uh, yep, I'm not seeing them. So, so I guess... Your homework is this website. So. Well, there you guys go for homework. Oh, you guys need to go to learnchef.com.
So, so what all is up there? Is it uh, some specific uh, tasks that they would go through to yeah, uh, learn things, uh, or? Yep. Um, we start. So we provide you a uh, not a, a VMware box, but we provide you an Amazon instance that kind of will follow you along as you're uh, developing your chef skills. So it um, it spins one up as you're doing your very first recipe creation, and then uh, it stays good for 24 hours. So if you abandon the project, then it'll auto delete after 24 hours. Um, but they're supposed to be lunchtime exercises, so anywhere from 15 to 35 minutes. 15 to 35 minutes. Yeah. All right. We try. And the other um, knife vSphere, for those that have vCenter uh, vSphere environments, uh, make sure you look at knife vSphere, which has all these features. Uh, it helps to be in the right directory. Uh, it helps to be not on the box. There you go. So Knife vSphere has all these um, functionalities um, already exist like today. So once you just do, um, and the other part I want to throw in is we have a new tool, which is completely free, um, called Chef DK. Um, and Chef DK is what we call our Chef Development Kit. And it sort of bundles all the tools be beyond just Chef into a simple consumable mi binary on your machine. You don't have to worry about stuff like Ruby and what version of Ruby you have installed. Like you download this, you install it, and then it comes with its own embedded Ruby environment. But then more importantly, it comes with the testing tools like Food Critic and Chefspec and Test Kitchen and Chef itself, um, all ready to go for you to use. So this way, you don't have to worry about setting up an environment. Um, we do support environments like Windows. In fact, I use it on my Windows computer all the time, and it works extremely well. Um, and Mac OS, and then it by default, by the way, does some OS detection, so it's like highlighting OS 10 for me. Um, but it also comes with a new command called Chef. So if you run Chef, you can actually also extend your Chef DK by doing Chef Gem install. And then when you do that, when you type in this one command, Chef Gem install knife dash vSphere, it'll install the knife vSphere knife plugin part of Chef DK, so you don't have to worry again about maintaining some sort of crazy system Ruby. Um, it's all handled by us then. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. there, there was one other question. I think you answered this before, but it might be worth just reiterating. I guess somebody's asking about, you know, what about just kind of putting the, the chef client in a image and having it register? So I assume you just put it in there, and I think there was like three files you said that needed to be there, right, so it could register correctly? Yeah, exactly. So let's look, take a look at one of these machines. We've picked on this sucker enough, so let's keep going on it. Um, so Etsy Chef is where we install. And by default, and we'll take a look at the, see how big that first boot is. It's not very big. Yep. Um, so by default, um, and currently the Chef Client recipe, by the way, can delete validation, but the three files that you need are these three files. And then the, th the fourth file is created when it's joined for the first time. So the validation.pem is a key that can only be used to add new servers to your Chef organization. And Chef Server 12 is by default multi-tenant. So if you have multiple organizations, they are sandboxed from one another. This is including in the open source version. But for that organization, there's called a, a, a validation key. Um, that's what needs to be on there. And some of our customers, what they do with VCO is they store this key on a, on a third party location, like a repository server. And then in VCO, they say, hey, uh, before you try to execute Chef, make an HTTP call out to that server to grab that PEM file. Uh -huh. So that way, if you want to manually update that PEM file or you want to easily change out that PEM file, there's no need for you to update all your templates because you just update it on that third-party location. Um, your first boot.json, what that looks like, is this. So by when I spun up my machine today, it was empty. And so my first boot was empty. But when you define something, Everything in these brackets right here would would be recipe colon and then the thing you're trying to define would be stored in the first boot.json. And then the last one is the client.rb, which looks like this. In this case, what it's doing is there's four lines where one, it's specifying the node name, which is actually optional. The three that are really required are these three lines. So the log lo location, like do you want the log to actually be put somewhere. In my case, I'm just going to standard out. Um, you have to need you need your chef server URL. That's sort of a given. 
uh, and then the last one is like the name of your validation key. So those are the, the three lines you need in order to uh, make a image that already has Chef Client pre-baked um, happy with your Chef environment. Great. And with that being said, it looks like uh, I'm not seeing any more questions in the question window. I'm not seeing anything else on, on the Twitters. So really great. Thank you for all your time. Thanks for hopping on and spending the time and sharing your knowledge here. And uh, you have a great evening. You as well. Thanks for having me. Not a problem. Anytime. If, if you ever want to come back, let us know. All right. Will do.